Amen. Pennsylvania just decided if you're from Delaware, you've got to quarantine as well now. Nobody likes Delaware, amen. Huh? <laughs> That's right, amen. So I was listening to uh, the radio, I guess, end of last week, and I told one or two people this. And it was a lady, I guess she's like one of the highest people in Delaware with the Department of Health. And somebody called up the radio station and uh, asked a question. So she had to answer it honestly. And she kind of stumbled for a second, kind of being caught. But basically what they said was is, if you get the COVID-19, you test positive, then while they're treating you, they test you a few times, you test positive each time. And finally, maybe the last two times you're negative, you can go back to work. So you've had nine tests, seven were positive, two were negative. Guess what they report? Seven new cases, even though seven of the cases were one person. So they're reporting seven positives, even though it was only one person. And she admitted, well, that's how we have to do it because we can't go in the system. We don't know how to change things. And it makes you wonder why we don't trust the government, amen? Their numbers aren't always right. But the average person doesn't know that because they're just watching their one news station, whether it's Fox or CNN, they're all pretty similar to me. But, uh, sorry guys. But they just listen to that same junk. They don't actually take the time to read or listen to other things themselves to kind of get a mix of everything. So I'm gonna go ahead and pray, and then I'm gonna talk about something that's gonna offend everybody in the room. I've never done that before. <laughs> all right, let's pray. Lord, I just love you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I ask you, Lord, uh, your will be done, Lord. Just uh, help us take what your word says, Lord. Help us to uh, act upon it, Lord, as you wish, God. Please, uh, just thank you, Lord, as that song we sang, Lord, for the perfect peace and rest, Lord, that we're all striving for, Lord. And there are so many turmoils and struggles and things that are affecting us, Lord, that we're not where we need to be, God, but we can only get that through you. Again, I love you, and I thank you for all you've done. I thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So, already, people say money makes the world go round. Money makes the world go round. So I had like 15 different things I was going to teach on, and I was praying about it and banging my head against it and trying to figure out what to do. And um, I was just reading and came across this and thought, this is something I'm working on, and I think it could be a help to people, especially now. All you hear about is nobody has money. You hear about uh, the pandemic and people not working. And what's funny is, I think about a, year, a little over a year ago now, we did a Dave Ramsey class, and uh, a bunch of people that took that class got a blessing, and they, some of them called me up when all this COVID stuff started, and they said, if it wasn't for that, I would have been a lot worse shape now. The fact that I actually started thinking about saving a little bit extra, or having a small cushion, or trying to get some things paid off. Now, if someone had been in a position where they had no debt, course the COVID thing wouldn't bother them or if they just had no debt but their house and had a savings it wouldn't bother you as much so what does the Bible say about money what does the Bible say about debt so we're not going to have time to go over everything but we're going to go over some verses here so they say money makes the world go around so let's start off with Acts 17 first and Lord willing we're going to do a lot of turning today There'll be a couple times I might read a few verses, but. All right, so Acts 17, we're going to start in verse 22. Acts 17, verse 22. Let me find the right page first. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshiped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitations, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. I'll just read a few more verses here. For in him we live and move. For in him we live and move and have our being, 
as certain also of your own poets have said, for ye are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he had ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. And verse 32, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So I read all that as a jumping off point. First in verse 28, we can see, For in him we live and move. So money does not make the world go round, guys. God makes the world go round. We've got to get our perspective proper and take a look at things right. But then I just uh, started looking at this, and I'm going to leave here in just a moment, but I thought this was funny. When you preach, some preachers don't like this, but when you preach, you're still in your flesh. They think everything they say is of God. I wish that were so. I'd never have to go home to an embarrassed wife or daughter. So what I think is, whether it's this church or the few churches I've preached at or been asked to preach at, when you get up and say something, sometimes you look out at the audience and I kind of picture that I'm Paul speaking to Mars Hill. I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. What are we worshiping and why? Where do we get our thoughts from? I don't know if it was Carl and I, somebody we were talking recently, that there are certain athletes that are very athletic. There are certain actors that do really well at getting paid to lie. There are certain chefs that can cook well. There are certain painters that paint well. But why do I care about any of their other opinions? Just like anybody else. If they're an athlete, that's what they get paid to do. A lot of them guys and gals barely made it through high school or college. They're stupid. They focused on one thing. I'm not saying they're horrible people, but why am I going to take what they say about a political issue or a spiritual issue, or a financial issue, or a worldly issue, any issue. Just shut up and play your sport. Just shut up and do your movie. I just want to pay for entertainment. I want to pay for a sport. I don't want to hear what you have to say about it. Now, some of you guys are crazy because you actually come to a church to hear what people have to say about things behind the pulpit, and they back it up with the Bible, hopefully, amen? Or you're here to hear from God, hopefully. So my thought is always, what does the Bible say? When Tim and I first got saved, we had music and different things we hadn't given up yet. My cousin Roe was really hard. He mocked us, gave us a hard time. We didn't quit. That got us thinking, what does God want? Because when I die, I'm not going to stand before Brother Chris. I'm definitely not going to stand before Brother Ron or Brother Joe. When I die, I'm standing before God. To whom much is given, much is required. We say we're Bible believers. We'll hit that in just a minute. So let's move on. Let's go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. So I know sometimes when I say things, I'm a little rough or I don't use the proper words. My goal is never to hurt anybody. My goal is to encourage you to thought, to get you to think, and to get you to prove me right or wrong with the Scripture. So 1 Timothy, we'll look at uh, chapter 6, verse 10. 1 Timothy 6, 10. <clears throat> For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and perceived themselves through with many sorrows. Now you have to pay attention to your words here, guys. It says the love of money. It doesn't say money is evil. The love of money. Okay, what is money? Money is like coin or banknotes, gold and silver. Let's go to Luke. Luke 16. Luke 16. Verse 13, Luke 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. So what's mammon? Mammon is riches or wealth. So why do people like money? No one cares about coins or pieces of paper that aren't worth anything. They like money because they want to have riches and wealth. They want things. 
we have this misconception in a lot of Baptist churches that because somebody saved their $200 extra they had for the month to put toward emergency or toward missions, that that person thinks they're spiritual instead of blowing it on junk, on a new phone or a new toy or new junk. Having money does not make you spiritual, but not having money does not make you spiritual. Jesus Christ makes you spiritual. But he talks a lot about what he thinks about money and what we do with it. So mammon is riches and wealth. So, okay, you have no money, but you have vehicles and toys and all these things. Yet you look down at people that don't have those things, but they were able to put away $200 last month. You have more than them. You're not looking at it properly because you're not reading properly. So it says here, you can't serve two masters. So what are riches? Possessions, or it could be good or money in abundance. There's nothing wrong with having riches. We have riches in Jesus Christ. Amen? We should have riches. There's nothing wrong with saying God's blessed me spiritually, physically, financially. None of those things are wrong. It's all a heart issue and what you're doing with it. If my sole purpose every morning is to get up just to make money, I'm not right with God. My sole purpose every morning should be to get up and please Jesus Christ. In that process, I've got to provide for my family. It's Bible. So I've got to make some money. But my heart isn't set on the money I make. Sometimes people come up to me and think because I'm in a shirt and tie a lot, but I have money. And then they think when I got a chicken farm, I have money. I don't have money. I have what's called debt. It is the total opposite from money. It makes me sick. I hate it. And when I got the chicken farm and got in debt is when I started thinking and I had these two, uh, I can't say certain words. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be nice in church. Weird, different, strange people that wanted to show me some videos about money. I thought, man, what a bunch of weirdos. That's a nice way to say it. But I watched the videos, and it got me under conviction. The guy wasn't King James, but he was saved. And what he said, I looked at my own Bible. I didn't just take it what he said, and I started thinking about money more and debt. So I gave you some definitions there. I'll get this off real quick. Uh, my definitions, I do use a Webster's 1828. Brother Mike is not against a Webster's 1828. When he preaches, guys, he's expecting him. Like, he's like preacher. When they preach, they're assuming on Mars Hill. No, they're not. They're in church, not Mars Hill. So they're assuming that you're going to use common sense and your own intellect. I think Brother Mike, I think it was last week, made a joke about the Webster's 1828. No one cares what dictionary you use. The Webster's 1828 is not the Bible. It's not inspired. But I'm not going to use the urban dictionary to look at Bible words. I'm not going to use the slang dictionary to look up Bible definitions. Noah Webster was saved in 1808. The guy had money. The guy was doing things. Then he got saved. He realized he was a sinner on his way to hell, and he got saved. So I'm going to stick with his dictionary because you know what they're doing today with the social media and the Internet? They're changing the words of the dictionary. Webster's, Cambridge, I uh, forget the, some of the other ones. Go to their websites and actually read, take some time off Facebook and read. And you'll realize they do surveys to communities. What does this word mean to you? And they change the definition today. That's scary, guys, to make people feel happy. You know, when I grew up, it was pink and blue, boy and girl. Now there's like 57, they say. Now we believe in science and truth, so we know it's only boy or girl. I don't care how you feel. Truth is truth. But a lot of Christians, their minds are getting warped where they're accepting. This movie star said this, and he was so good in that movie where he wasn't really that person. He just pretended to be. And I'm going to listen to what they say. Or this athlete that beats their wife or girl, well, girlfriend, because they're not married, beats his girlfriend and doesn't pay his child support and robs people and then pays them off. He is so good. I'm going to listen to everything he says. Sometimes we need to stop and think. And it's scary when you stop and think. If you start realizing the state you're in, then you may have to make changes and get right. I know. I deal with it all the time. You've got to stop and think, though, guys. So, all right, this is, I'm going to move on. I've got to say this real quick because the Webster thing got me thinking. I'm working on this study, and I'm not going to do it today. I told one or two people because I thought it was neat. I know Derek's probably hating me for moving around up there. But uh, I've got a picture of a swastika, a peace symbol, the victory sign, and BLM. I'm going to hold it up to people one day and ask them what their thoughts are on it. Nobody reads. Nobody cares. What's my movie star say? What's my rapper say? What's my friend say? 
Swastika has been bad for 70, almost 80 years. 4,000 years before that, Christians, Native Americans, Hindus, Buddhists, a bunch of people used a swastika. In Japan, they used it. They still have it. A car company in Michigan stopped using it in the early 1900s. A tool company in Florida. Ab uh, Abraham Lincoln, no. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party took it in the 20s, 30s, and they stole it. So I agree, today if someone wore swastika, I'd probably think they're not doing it for the right reason because they don't know the history of it. Unless they were Native American or Hindu. There's still temples out in Asia that have it on. They're not anti-Jew, that's just what they do. So people don't read anymore. The peace symbol, everyone loves putting on little girls. Nero's cross, Maurice did a study on this 15 years ago. Nero would turn people upside down that were Christians, break their arms, light them on fire, and have dinner parties, and point and laugh and say, when all the Christians are dead, we'll have peace. What he meant is he thought he would sleep better when people stopped telling him there was a God who was going to judge him. But we wear the peace symbol like it's no big deal. We put it on our kids. We don't care. We don't care about any of that stuff. When I was a kid, my grandfather, who was English, uh, was in Normandy and all those different things during the war, would tell me stories when forces went into other countries and they overpowered them and killed their men, they'd walk through the town, victory, we won, obey us, victory. A bunch of hippies in America got high, decided to hate Jesus Christ and listen to rock and roll music and have sex and get high on drugs and said, no, no, this means peace, man. What do a bunch of stupid Christians do today? They believe it means peace. To most of the world, it doesn't. I wonder when the Pope's doing this, if he means peace or if he knows he thinks his victory's coming. People don't pay attention. Black Lives Matter started by three ladies who, with good intentions, started on a lie, if you read the history. A cop never hurt Trayvon Martin. It was a mixed guy who was doing uh, security in his little community, and the Trayvon Martin kid, he shouldn't, he shouldn't have died. I don't think anybody should die until they get judged in a court of law. It's America. But he had been stealing stuff in school, had been moved up there, there had been thefts in that neighborhood, it just made sense, he shouldn't have been there, he shouldn't have fought to get the gun, he should have waited till the cops come. Okay? Michael Brown, a lot of the sports stars, today people are protesting. And it's emotion, not logic. Because you need to use logic. Hands up, don't shoot. You guys have heard that, right? Never happened. They got that from Ferguson in 2014, I think, with Michael Brown. You know what happened? When the cops show up, Michael Brown's crackhead drug dealing friend said, man, he was innocent. He had hands up. He got shot. Everybody went with that. No one did their research. When they had the grand jury and the subpoena, all the people, almost every single person in that room, I think, was black. It shouldn't matter, but for some reason it does for identity politics. But every single person there said he never had his hands up. Every single person there said what they saw, plus with the videotape, that he had just robbed the store. The cop had went to stop him and talk to him. The cop was in his car. And all the cops said is, hey, man, you got to get out of the street. I'm going to a robbery. He goes through the window, grabs the guy's gun. I forget the guy's name. It escaped my memory. That guy had requested to be on that street. He said, I have black friends and family. I need to help that community. I want to be there so things are fair. That white cop was not a race racist. Michael Brown goes to grab the cop's gun from his hip. The cop's grabbing it. He gets shot in the hand. All the witnesses say this. Michael, Michael Brown walks away from the car, and not a minute later, he gets down like a bull, and he rushes the cop. Gets down low. What's the cop do? I would do it. A big, giant guy, high on drugs, rushes me. He shoots him. All these riots happen. Nobody cares what the Bible says. No one cares about truth anymore. Let's get caught up in our emotion. Is there a bad cop or two? Yeah, there is. There's a couple bad preachers. There's a couple bad church members. A couple bad garbage men. A couple bad post, postal workers. There's bad people ever, guys. It's called sin. But we get caught in these lies and these emotions make us feel good. It gets me so upset. I had one of the kids last year, and this is off, I know totally off, but man, it got under my skin. One of the kids in my junior church class talking about a guy who was killed in Atlanta at a Wendy's doing nothing wrong just because he was black. Rayshard Brooks had felonies on his record for kidnapping children and holding, holding them hostage. He was on probation, gets drunk and passes out in the Wendy's drive through with cars in front and behind him. What are the Wendy's employees supposed to do? They call the cops, say, this guy's passed out. We don't know if he's drunk or if he's sick. We need help. Cops show up to help him, realize once they get him out of the way that he's drunk. Make him take a sobriety test. He fails it. The watch the whole video, guys, not the one minute you see on TV. 
he attacks the cops as they're arresting him. Normally what you do, you put your hands behind your back, you get in the car, you go to jail, you get out that night. He attacks the cops, grabs a taser gun and runs, turns back to shoot a cop. Now let's think for a second. If someone shoots a cop with a taser gun and they're not able to move anymore, that means they can get the cop's gun. If you're willing to shoot a cop, you'll shoot anybody. Absolutely. That cop was doing nothing wrong, doing his job. George Floyd, years earlier, had just got out of jail two years earlier, done five years in jail for a home invasion where he put a gun in a pregnant woman's stomach. She was black. He's black. You thought Black Lives Matter. Puts the gun in her gut and pushes it up and says, I'll kill you and your baby. Tell me where your money is. But nobody cares. They put him up. They're making, they're naming laws after him. They're putting murals of this guy. I don't want a guy like that anywhere associated with anybody in my family. They're bad people. They shouldn't have died, but they're bad people. They would have been in prison or died some other way later on. Instead of defunding the police, we need to defend the police. And we need to figure out a way to train police better. I'm not saying they're not, you know, they're perfect. They're not. But we need to work, figure out how to train people. But how can I train, we train people when Christians don't even want to train? We'll spend more time on social media and what our friends think and actors think than what the Word of God thinks. What does God say? What does God say about anything? Can you parents in here quote me verses about parents? Can you children quote me verses about children? Can you quote me verses about a pastor? I can't quote them all. I need to work on it. But forget about me for a second. Think about you, because <clears throat> you're going to stand before God. And God's not going to care when you say, well, Brother Ken can only do this. Brother Ken didn't do this. Or Brother Ken this. Or Pastor this. Pastor this. Brother Mike this. Brother Mike this. Guys, we have a church full of examples that you can look at to justify your sin. But you're going to stand before God. While you're here, the funny thing is, lost people apply the principles of this book, and things in their life go well. Lost people apply the principles of this book. This is a handbook. There are secular people that aren't saved that still think this is a wisdom book, and they take ideas from this book. So why did I say all that? That was a little bit off subject. I kind of got my flesh because I hate kids being lied to, whether it's Santa Claus or all cops are bad or all doctors are perfect or all priests and preachers are perfect. They're not. People are flesh and they sin. But when it comes to finances, nobody wants to pay attention to what the Bible says. It's all about how I feel, just like the people protesting. I feel. I feel like when I protest, rob, rape, loot, I don't need to wear a mask. But when Ken walks in a rural farms, he gets kicked out for not wearing a mask. I'm going to start protesting when I go in with a sign. That way no one will say anything to me. What's the big deal? Why do people get so caught up? Because the news says we should. Okay, the 700 cases in the last few weeks of COVID-19 are probably only 70 people. And most of them are young and they're not dying. And it's probably not even COVID because they're getting paid to switch it from the flu and everything else to COVID because it's all money thing, guys. And remember, some of those hospitals love that money. Money's not bad, the love of it is. All right, for sake of time, I'm just gonna move on here. I know you guys said, I wish you'd moved on a while ago. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17, this will be quick. I'm gonna read two verses here. And then I'm going to go to Galatians 6 next. So 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let's jump over to Galatians 6, verse 15. Galatians 6, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. So we're new creatures if we're saved. So if I'm new, that means some of the things I used to do are old, and I shouldn't do them anymore. My thoughts should be different. I shouldn't want to, like Pastor says, the Bible talks about steal no more. Whether it's the time clock, whether it's money, whether it's energy, whatever it is, we should be different. But you know what happens? People get saved, and they listen to this fake grace gospel. Brother Mike talks about it a lot. Well, I'm saved. Have grace on me. 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 No. You're going to be judged by God. I'm told to judge you in the Bible. You're not told to judge me. Yeah. The Bible says I am. Yeah. Check it out. Yeah. I'm going to make a call. So let's say you just got right. Rapist, pedophile. You knock on my door. Can I stay the night in your house? No. no. Sorry, guys. I'm judging you. Let's say I see you walking up my driveway with a you know, bloody machete and a machine gun and 
your face is all messed up, I'm not going to go out and give you a hug and say good morning. I'm going to pray, and my wife or daughter will probably shoot you. But we judge. We make judgments all the time. You go into a certain part of town, it doesn't matter if it's black or white or yellow. It could be Chinatown, and that would probably be the best part of town because I love Chinese food. But you see shady characters, and they're women sometimes. Some of the women are scarier than the men. And you think in your head, I'm not going to go down the street by myself. And if you're smart, you don't. If you're stupid like me, you just do whatever. But it doesn't matter, guys. We have judges. Everyone judges. You should use common sense. So there's nothing wrong with that. So we shouldn't be doing things we used to do. We should be doing things a new way. Let's go to James. And this is why we don't, I believe. I'm going to read two verses here in James. And guys, we can talk later about different application of verses. I'm comfortable in my Bible. We can talk. I'm trying to make something simple and easy. So simple, hard thing is, no matter who preaches, I'm always like, Lord, I hate this. Like Brother Joe Tucker, I told him once, I was so mad when Joe Tucker called to preach one Sunday night because I wanted to. And my flesh wants to turn him off. But I have to be like, Lord, you can give me something through anybody. If you can use an old gangbanger who still likes the Redskins. Oh, I just said the bad word at church. <laughs> I should get executed for that. But then again, it depends who kills me if it makes it okay. Um, so James 1.8. We'll look at James 1.8 first. What does all this have to do with money? It's your, your, your thought process. You're a new creature. What you think about the Bible. Okay? James 1.8. A double-minded man is unstable in all, in all his ways. So let's go to James 4.8. Compare that. James 4, 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Scripture is scripture. I would say it's pretty simple to say a double-minded man is someone who's not getting close to God. I'm not saying they didn't used to be. George used to always use the best analogy for me about someone going up a hill, or if you're not as close to God as you've ever been, you're backslidden. If you're not actively trying to get closer to God today, you're going to be double-minded. You're falling back. You're going to think, this is okay, or this is okay, or this is okay. No, it's not. Yes, it is. What does the Bible say? So, what is the problem with me and with most of you? I should say all of you, but there might be one good person in here. I doubt it, but you know what the problem is with some Bible believers? I like to think... Your situation, situational Bible believers, it's a big word. Your situational Bible believers. You're a Bible believer when it's convenient. There go. I see Chris doing something wrong. Chris, the Bible says, and it's wrong. Yeah, I told him. And I was right. He was wrong. But then I go home and do something different wrong. Not the same thing he did, maybe something different. Am I not a Bible believer? Is not wrong wrong? Is not sin sin? Well, I don't think, well, I don't, shut up, what does God think? There's nothing wrong with saying I'm a Bible believer and I'm growing. And I've got some of these things I'm doing pretty well at, I think, Lord help me, and I need to work on this. The problem is, you know what most people say? I got this, I'm good, don't think about anything else. What does the Bible say about how you should act to work? As a father, as a child, we talk about all the different things. What does the Bible say? How should you be? Do what you want. We're never supposed to do what we want, guys. We're bought with a price. So you go out, I think just yesterday, Brother Joe, it was like 23 people showed up. So whether it's tracking, street preaching, assembling at church, your dress code, whether it's fellowship, charity, judgment, what you watch, how you speak, what you waste money on, which credit card or bank you worship. Some of you have that stuff under control. You know what you don't have under control? Tracking, street preaching, assembling a church, dress code, child rearing, fellowship, charity, judgment, what you watch, how you speak, what you waste your money on, which credit card or bank you worship. We can go over and over. You might have one or two things. Oh, I hand out tracts every day. I street preach once a month. I pray every morning. I read my Bible. I treat my friends like dirt. I lie. I cheat. I steal. I go to church faithfully. Guys, we're not perfect. We're not supposed to give up, though, and stop. We're supposed to continue to push on and look. Don't be a situational Bible believer. Be a Bible believer. That last part, I saw some eyebrows pop up. Which credit card or bank do you worship? Do you remember the old-time preachers praying for the new credit card to come in the mail so they could pay off some bills? No. 
Remember the old-time preachers praying about the new loan they're going to get? No. It's the opposite. People are usually praying to get out of debt, not to get into debt. Amen. Nobody wants to get into debt. We all do. Guys, I am one of the kings of debt. I'm not proud of it, but I can talk about it. It's like Walter Williams, one of the first black conservatives I ever listened to before Candace Owen and Brandon Tatum and all those guys. Walter Williams used to say things about the black community where they need some help. And he'd say, if anyone gets upset, tell them a black man said you can say that. Guys, what does the Bible say? Forget what the world says. What does the Bible say? I don't worship a bank. I don't worship my credit cards. What's worship mean? To adore, to pay divine honors to, to reverence with supreme respect and veneration, to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission as a lover. Some of you guys treat your credit card or your bank better than you do your spouse or your kids. Some of you put more faith in that than you do in God. So my wife and I have gone through some financially really crazy rough times. And people have asked us before, I mean, the Lord's blessed you. Why do you, did the Lord bless you? Why did this happen? Why did this happen? Why did that happen? And all I can say is that we were stupid enough to trust in the Lord. So let's go to Psalms. And guys, I'm not saying we're perfect and we're super spiritual, but I remember calling preacher with my money problems and my concerns. Preacher telling me to have my daughter pray over the bills. We'll go to Psalm 18. He's like, have your daughter, you know, she's only two years old. Have her pray over your bills. Talk to her about what's going on. Explain things to her in the Bible. I never limited my daughter what she could read in her Bible. It's the Word of God. Read it all. Daddy, what's this mean? Honey, I'll tell you in a couple years. I can't explain it to you now. You're too young. Okay, Daddy. She learned authority that way. So Psalm 18, verse 30. Am I in the right spot here? I am. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. A buckler is like a shield. Okay? It says, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. Some of these celebrities and these crazy people are saying things. Can you imagine if someone kicks down your door, knocks you out, knocks out both adult, all the adults in the house and just the kids, and one of the kids runs to the phone, dials 911, and says, I need police in my house. And the person on the line says, I'm sorry, we don't have police anymore. Can you hand the phone to the bad person? Well, I'm hiding because they're going to kill me. Oh, honey, it's okay. I'm going to talk to him about puppies and flowers. We need police. Train, retrain the police, I'm fine with. Defund the police is ridiculous. So trust, what are we putting our trust in? Okay, it says here we should trust in the Lord. And it says the word of the Lord is tried. Have you ever tried it? It's scary. Have you ever done what the Bible says? Oh, I did what this book said. I did what that guy said. I did what that lady said. I did what that TV show says. Or these days, I did what that YouTuber said. What does God say? What does God say? Proverbs 22, verse 7. Let's go over to your right to Proverbs. We'll hit these quick. That actually, what I just gave you guys was my intro. So uh, that's, what did I say? Proverbs 22. I don't even know where I'm at. Between the A and the T. Proverbs 22, verse 7. Proverbs 22, verse 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. I hate being a slave. I don't have time to go into it. My family history far back, they were indentured servants and slaves. Israelites were slaves. One of the first, the first man in South Carolina to own slaves was a black man. Why do I say that? To make us think. Slavery was wrong. I agree with that. But it was the culture. It was people doing it as a whole. So let's go to Matthew 5.42. Matthew 5.42. I didn't spend a lot of time on that slave thing because anybody here who's ever been in debt understands what I'm talking about. The angst and the fear, the concern when you have to pay somebody money. I don't want to be a slave. I am right now. That's why I deal with chickens because I have bills to pay. But Matthew 5, verse 42. 
Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Let's go back to Exodus. Exodus 22. Brother Squeak preached the message a long time ago, and I hated it, but I never forgot it, and it's convicted me about when you give somebody something, you shouldn't expect something back in return for it. You should give of a clean heart. So Exodus 22, verse 25. What's the Bible say? If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as a usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. What is usury? Usury is interest. Guys, I know we're not Jews. We can apply things. If it works for them, it can work for us. We shouldn't be lending people out money to people in church and expecting gain back. Years ago, we had no money. I needed gas in my car. I don't even think I told my wife this after the fact because she would have told me to walk to work. Went to Pastor Ryman. I said, Pastor, can I borrow 20 bucks? I'll pay you on Friday when I get paid. You know what Pastor said? Oh, George, you don't have to pay me back. I got gas, went to work. In the week when I got paid, I paid him back his $20. He didn't ask for 21 or 22, but I had to give it back to him quick because I know my flesh. So let's go to Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25. So we can see the Bible is against uh, usury or interest. Now, I'm not saying it's a sin. If you have to have a loan for a house or certain things, it's between you and God. But we shouldn't be so flippant about it and be so quick to, to put, get in debt over everything. Like I need a new pair of shoes. Some of those stupid shoes, those guys, what are they, hundreds of dollars? That's ridiculous to put on your stinking feet. So Leviticus 25, verse 37. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase, victuals. So you can't even give him food. You can expect something back. There's no problem with Brother Chris wanting my sweaty rag, and he gives it back to me. I can lend it to him. He can give it back, but he's not going to give it back to me with usury, with interest. So guys, if you borrow my trailer give it back. Just don't give me any money afterwards, but uh, if you break something, fix it. Amen. So let's go to Proverbs 3 real quick. We're going to wrap up here in a few minutes. Proverbs 3. There's a lot of verses in the Bible, guys. That first whole intro thing was to try to get your brain to think, because you've got to make a decision in your heart. Do you care what the Bible says or not? It's a simple yes or no. If it's a yes, what are you trying to do to get better at it? So much time on the internet doing junk. So many movies and books that are junk. You can't spend a little bit of time studying. All right. Proverbs 3. I'll start in verse 1. My son, forget, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace they shall add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Everybody knows this part. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. But what's after that? Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. So we're not going to talk about the grape juice and all that. It's not fermented. We'll deal with that another day. But you see what it says there at the end? In verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance, with what you are and what you have, and with the first fruits of thine increase. So God's not against us increasing. He's not against us doing right with our substance, with our money, our first fruits of our jobs, our labors. There's nothing wrong with doing right with it. So let's take a head, go ahead and take a look. Uh, and we know we should give to God. Psalms 37.21. Let's back up to Psalm 37.21. Psalm 37.21. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again. But the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. 
I went through some hard times. I made some really bad mistakes. I couldn't pay back what I, the full amount I was supposed to. It bothered me. I believe as a Christian, what the Bible says and the example it gives, that we should pay things back. We can't have this attitude. Pastor talks about it back in the late 90s when people thought Y2K was coming. They maxed out their credit cards to buy all this junk because the Lord's coming back. I don't have to pay it back. Doesn't that bother your heart to take something that's not yours and not pay it back? Does your word mean nothing? If you're a Christian and you represent Jesus Christ, you represent a church, have no honor or humility anymore, shame. It's sad. Our churches are falling apart because people are just flipping about everything. Leviticus 19. Let's go to Leviticus 19. Leviticus 19. I don't know if it's good or bad this is being recorded, but you can go back and look at the verses and study them out in their context, and we can talk. Leviticus 19.11. Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. And we don't have time to get into who's my neighbor. Jesus talked about that, guys, in your New Testament. Hopefully you know who your neighbor is. It's everybody. Okay? So I'm not stealing someone's cow. What are you stealing? Money, time, effort, whatever it is. Your heart knows. So, uh, and you're also, uh, when you're agreeing to pay something back and you don't, that's a lie. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, verse 26. Guys, I'm no saint. I've uh, had a foreclosure. I've had charge off and collections I've had to deal with. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. But my goal is to learn from it and do better. Proverbs 22, verse 26. Be not thou one of them that strike hands or of them that are sureties for debts. Now let's look at verse 27. If has to do with what we just read before. Thou has nothing to pay. Why should he take away thy bed from under thee? So it looks like the Bible's kind of given us some ideas here about money to pay what we owe, not to borrow what we can't pay. You really need that new treadmill. I've had it almost 20 years. It hasn't done me a lot of good. It's held a lot of boxes, a lot of jackets and coats and pants have hung on that new treadmill and it costs a lot of money but um but i got it like an idiot so let's go to luke luke 14 28 guys it's not what i say it's not what your youtube youtubers say it's not what pastor brother mike says it's, what's the bible say and you can take one verse out of context i know you can Check these verses out. I try to keep everything in the context for which it's in. So Luke 14. Remember, guys, mammon, wealth. Luke 14, verse 28. I wasn't going to read the whole chapter, but for time. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? I would love to have one of those million-dollar mansions on the, on the water can't afford it. Most people can get approved for anything if they know how to work things out properly, but we can't afford it, so we shouldn't do it. Just common sense. So Psalms 37.3. I was going to give you guys a quiz. My daughter got mad at me. I said, it's Sunday school. Don't people take quizzes in school anymore? But um, Psalm 37.3. I messed up in a lot of these areas. I did a lot of things wrong. I told God I was sorry, and I'm trying to get things right. But if your heart is, I'm going to do what I want, don't tell me, then don't say you're a Bible believer. You're one of those situational ones. Only what makes you feel good or fits you. Psalm 27, verse 27 is not the right one. Did I say Pro Proverbs 27? Oh, 37, thank you. 37, verse 3. Going back. So Psalm 37, verse 3 says, Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. So if I trust in God, he's going to feed me. Well, I don't believe that. That's Old Testament. I've lived it. My wife and I, we're not perfect, but we've put our trust in the Lord. We've gone through some hard times. 
People have shown up at our house. They used to go to church here and drop food off on our doorstep. We've got checks mailed in the mail to us to buy things. No one even knew. One time someone mailed a check here, and it was the exact amount of a car repair we needed. I believe what the Bible says. I'm not just going to pick and choose. So let's say in Psalm 37, let's look at verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. I don't know why I wrote that one down. Let me see here. Judged. All right, it's all good. So we'll move on. Um, oh, I was going to read a little more than that. That's what it was. We'll read all the way through 27. <coughs> the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteousness forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. So go over to Proverbs 27. In two minutes, we'll finish these couple of verses. So with the Bible, it looks like if you trust God and do your best to do right, God will provide for you. He may not get you what you want, but he'll get you what you need. Proverbs 27, verse 27. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food for thy food of thy household, and for the maintenance of thy maidens. Could you ask for more than that, all the goat's milk you could have? So uh, that's the type of God's going to provide for you and take care of you. Let's go to 1 Timothy 5.8. I can make half the room happy, so I'll attack some of the guys and the ladies will smile. So let's go to 1 Timothy. It's in my Bible here somewhere. 5.8. First Timothy 5.8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. God gives you the ability to work. God will provide through that work. I believe scripturally it's the man's job to do the work. I don't think there's anything wrong with a woman working. It doesn't say a woman can't work. But I don't think the woman should be the one to raise the kids, take care of all the house, make all the money, and do everything where the guy sits on his butt watching TV all day. Or so I can't say that word in church. Sits on his backside watching TV all day. All right, the Bible says if any man not, uh, provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house. See, we're all each other's own. But then especially for your own house, he has denied the faith. He's worse than an infidel. It's between you and the government and God, what you do with government assistance, you should really pray about it and see what the scripture says and who you're putting your faith in. Genesis 2.15, uh, two more verses, and then we'll stop. Or the preacher will come out and yell at me to stop, and I'll stop. So these the last two verses. Genesis 2.15. Did I say that? Chris said you said you were going to stop an hour ago. Um, Genesis 2.15. This is a harsh one. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So God's going to take care of you, but God gives us something to do, and we need to do it. So I believe everybody can work. I remember uh, seeing the different people at Walmart. I mean, there's jobs out there. Michael Shane worked for some kids and adults that had special needs and stuff, and they got jobs. This is America. Things are tough today, but there's still things that can be done. People still want their yard rigged. People still want a lot of things done. Let's go to Genesis 30. And we'll stop here. I got two more pages, but we can hold off on those. I can tell you to read Matthew 6 and Philippians 4 later. But Genesis 30, we're just going to hit verse 20, uh, 37. I'm, 27, I lied. 30, 27. Genesis 30, verse 27. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thy eyes, tarry. For I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for thy sake. So Jacob was rewarded for his work. There's nothing wrong with working. 
But the issue is, I don't understand. When I say guys, I mean everybody, but I guess it kind of leans toward guys. Because so, of me being in banking, some of you guys sometimes will come to me and complain and, oh, I work so hard for my money and I don't have any money. I work so hard. I'm never with my family. And then you waste it. You just throw it away on junk. I'm not saying you can't have things sometimes and need things, but I'm going to challenge you, not me, not pastor, for you to go talk to God. Don't talk to us. And ask God what he thinks you should do. I was kind of quick because of time. I gave you a bunch of verses. What does the Bible say? Um, the Bible doesn't say anything bad about credit cards. It talks about usury. It talks about counting the cost. If you can't afford it, don't get it. it talks about mammon. Why is it that if someone has $10 in their pocket, we think they're rich, but if somebody has no dollars in their pocket but has cable, internet, <clears throat> cars, shoes, guns, toys, clothes, all this fancy stuff, because they choose to waste their money on that filthy mammon, and someone else chooses to save it. Both could be wrong, both could be right, but you need to pray about it for you and see what the Bible says. Lord, I love you, Lord. I thank you for being so good to us, God. I ask you, Lord, uh, as a church, Lord, I know people don't like talking about money, Lord, but I just thank you, Lord, uh, for the opportunity, God, help us to do right, Lord. There's this whole stinking, filthy world, Lord. I know you'll provide it for us if we're faithful and true. I know, like Pastor says, God's not going to trust us with a lot of money because we're not right with it. Lord, so please help us to make wise decisions and make good choices, God. And when missionaries come in, if we have the August Revival, Lord, or if people need things through our church family, God, be a blessing if we all could be in a position, Lord, to help each other out, God. But we'll always have that HBO or that sports package or any other junk we waste our money on. Lord, please convict our hearts, Lord. Help us to do right, God. Help us to do better as a church. Uh, it's a shame that we had to take up three offerings for the police, and we're still not even there yet. Lord, help our church to do better. Help us to be real Bible believers. I hate the term real. Help us to be Bible believers on everything, not just on one subject. Like Brother Mike said, <clears throat> if we disagree with somebody, Lord, help us to get over it and just talk to them and just study out the scriptures, God. Again, I love you. Thank you for all you've done. I ask you to save that soul in earth's hell and just be with the church service. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys, I guess we have 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, that's right.